Hey, everybody. So glad to see you today at church. Come on, let's welcome everybody that's watching. We're so, so glad that you're tuning in and that you're in one of our campuses right now. Uh, it's just such a privilege to be able to gather to teach God's Word. And I am so thrilled to be in this series on the kingdom of God. You've heard me say it, and I'm going to say it a whole lot because I have a mandate from God right now to preach on the kingdom of God. The Lord spoke to me and gave me a word, preach on the kingdom. And so I plan on just preaching on the kingdom until I don't have anything else to say. And then I'm going to repeat the series. No, I'll just play it. I'll spare everybody from that. But uh, the first week I talked about the priority of the kingdom. Jesus said, seek first. Above everything else, we're to seek the kingdom of God, the government of God. That means to lean into it, try to understand it, study it. It can be an abstract topic. And a lot of people just bl uh, blaze past it because they don't understand. But we're going to dive into it. We're going to seek it. Last week, I talked about the three ages of the kingdom. It's the one that was and is and is to come. And uh, we just talked about the three ages of the kingdom of God. And this week, I'm going to talk to you on the subject, kingdom immigration. Kingdom immigration. What does it take to immigrate into the kingdom of God. And I like to talk about the kingdom of God in terms of a government, because we often think of the kingdom of God in terms of a religion. Uh, and if you missed the last few sermons, one of my favorite phrases from this whole thing is that Jesus didn't come to establish the religion of God. He didn't come to establish this new religion called Christianity. We think that he came to establish Christianity, this, and, and the whole world calls us a religion, right? But he didn't come to establish the religion of God. He came to establish the kingdom of God, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. And we have to really lean in to the gospel of the kingdom. So we're going to be talking about immigration. What does it take to migrate into the kingdom of God? Here's some questions I have for you. Is it easy? to enter the kingdom of God. Is it easy? And right now I see people nodding their head yes and no. It's because people are confused about it. Is it easy to enter into the kingdom of God? And here's another question. How do people enter the kingdom of God? If it's this government, if it's a nation, if it's a kingdom, how do people become citizens of this kingdom? How do they do it? And here's another question. Are there people who think that they've entered, but really they haven't? Is it possible that there are people who think that they're citizens of heaven, but are not citizens of heaven? Again, I got people doing this, like people don't know. So that's what I want to talk, to about, talk about. Is it easy to enter the kingdom? How do you enter the kingdom? And are there people who think that they're a part of the kingdom of God and they're not? I know that you want to hear the answer. And I'd like to use as a text Matthew chapter 19 and verse 22. This is a story about a rich guy who came to Jesus. And you know where I'm going with it. This rich guy wanted both. He wanted to be very successful in this life and he wanted to be called good. So he came to Jesus and Jesus knew where his heart was and Jesus asked him to sell everything and give it to the poor and come and follow him. And the Bible says that the rich man went away sad because he had so much stuff. And, and let's just read this and it's gonna help us answer our question. But when the young man heard this, he went away sad for he had many possessions. Then Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you the truth, it is very hard, very hard. So that's part of our answer. Is it easy to enter the kingdom? No, it's very hard. He said, it's very hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. I'll say it again, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were astounded. Then who in the world can be saved? They asked. Jesus looked at them intently and said, humanly speaking, it is impossible. There you have it. Humanly speaking, 
It is impossible for us to become citizens of the kingdom of God. You could work your whole life. You could give your whole life to feeding the hungry, lifting people out of poverty, giving your life to whatever good cause you want to give it to. But humanly speaking, it's impossible to transfer your citizenship from the citizenship of the world to the citizenship of the kingdom of God. There are so many similarities uh, between entering the kingdom of God and immigration. Uh, I have a friend who is an Australian, and every year he and his wife applied to become citizens of America. And there's a lottery. And the year that they applied, there were 60,000 different applications to get a green card to become an American citizen. 60,000 people. And out of 60,000, they chose like 100 people to receive these green cards. They were one of the families that got a green card to be able to come to the United States. They had already built a pretty good life there in Australia, but they sold everything they had. Sounds a lot like the kingdom of God. They sold everything they had and they moved to America. They didn't know anybody, but they switched to a different culture. They bought a house here in America and now they're building a life here in America. And there's so many similar traits to immigration. And it's not easy to immigrate to America. Uh, some people that have been around Bethany know for a long time that when I was a child, around six years old, we had a girl that was from Africa come to live with us. I'll never forget it. Uh, what had happened is my mom and dad, years before that, had found her abandoned by a little muddy stream. Her grandfather couldn't afford to support her, so he abandoned her as an infant next to a uh, a, a little stream of water. They found her, she was almost dead. They brought her to their house and they nursed her back to health. It took them almost a month to get her body back into health. She was taken care of by missionaries there in Africa, but they had it in their heart to bring her to America. So she came to America not knowing any English and we as a family brought her in and adopted her. We tried to go through the legal process of adoption for several years and were unable to get certified from the government of Nigeria to legally adopt her. So there was another family in our church, a Nigerian family in our church that also attempted to adopt her. They lived in Washington, DC, so she moved to be with them for several years and the adoption still would not go through. So without her having a family here, she had to move back to Nigeria as a, as a teenager. So she moved back to Nigeria and there she went to live with a, an amazing pastor and his wife and she continued her education there. And now she's got her master's in uh, English literature and she teaches there in Nigeria. She's awesome. But I know firsthand the difficulties of immigrating into a country. It's, it's almost impossible to get in. And there's so many similarities to this in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is a citizenship and you have to immigrate out of the world and into this new citizenship. And so I'd like to give you a simple process and, and some four thoughts of how to immigrate into this new system. Are you ready? The first one is you have to overcome the obstacles. Say it with me, overcome the obstacles. Here are some obstacles that people faced. Number one, religion is a huge obstacle to the kingdom of God. What is religion? Religion is doing a God thing without God. Can I say that again? Religion is doing a God thing without God. Religion gives you a fake ticket to heaven. Recently, we were in the uh, national championship and my wife and I decided that we wanted to go to the national championship and we didn't have a ticket. So we drove down there and people were selling tickets everywhere, or so we thought. They were all fake tickets. And we were trying to determine if the person we wanted to buy a ticket from was a real person. And this was a very expensive ticket. And so I was about to give this man over $1,000 to purchase these precious tickets to the national championship. And a friend of mine said, man, I don't know. I, I, I have a bad feeling about this. And the guy was like, I'm telling you, these are, these are good tickets. And I, I, everything in me said that this guy was right and he was genuine. And I almost gave him the money to purchase this ticket. And uh, my friend had this 
crazy idea. He said, well, you know, there's that app that can scan the tickets and tell if they're real or not. And he was totally making that up because they don't even have such an app. <laughs> and I could see this guy's face kind of drop a little bit. And he said, yeah, just hand me the tickets. I'll scan them and I'll see if they're real or not. And so the guy was deliberating in his mind if he wanted to get caught. And he thought about it for three seconds and then he turned around and walked off. He was a fraud. And I almost gave this guy a ton of money to get into that game. Thank God I didn't buy a fake ticket to the game. Religion is a fake ticket into the kingdom of God. It, it gives you this feeling that you're getting in, but you're not. It's a lot of religion. It's all these things that you do to feel devout and to feel pious and to feel good. But none of this stuff will get you to the place of citizenship in heaven. Religion is a fake ticket. Another obstacle is loving this world. It's impossible to love this world and have the love of the Father in you. Jesus, this was a a barrier for many people that Jesus invited along the journey. They said, let me go back and, and bury my father. And he said, no. He said, let me go back and, and, and tell people bye. He said, no. I mean, you have to forsake this world to change your citizenship. That's costly. It's, it's costly. First John chapter two, verse 15 says, do not love this world, nor the things it offers you. For if you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. Have you ever seen the illustration of a monkey that tries to get a banana out of a cookie jar? Basically, if they put a, a banana in a cookie jar, a monkey will stick his hand down in the jar to try to get the banana out of the cookie jar. And he will stay there for days trying to get the banana out and they can catch him like that. They, they, some even said that they will starve to death trying to get the banana out of the cookie jar. Basically, they can't forsake the thing in the jar. You're just like, man, you're not gonna get it out, run. But that's how this world is. If you can't let this world go, you can't inherit the kingdom of God. Another obstacle is, is pride. Pride, this sense of I know everything. In a moment, I'm gonna talk about humility, but God actually opposes the proud. He will never allow a proud person into the kingdom of God. If you know it all and you're unwilling to change your thinking, if you're unwilling to change your mind, if you will not become like a little child and abandon the way that you have thought, if you're prideful and arrogant in your thought patterns, then it's impossible to inherit the kingdom of God. You have to come moldable, you have to come humble, and you have to say, everything that I know, I count it as loss, and I'm embracing this new thought pattern. And many people are not wanting to do that. They wanna come into the kingdom of God, but still maintain everything that they thought about the world. And you can't, you have to humble yourself and become like a little child. So those are the obstacles. So the second, part of coming into the kingdom of God. First, you have to overcome the obstacles. Second is you have to have the right attitude. As I mentioned, you can't come to the kingdom of God with your prideful attitude. Uh, I was in a line at um, coming back into America from a foreign country, going through U.S. customs. And people who've been traveling a long time, they're a little grumpy. But I can just tell you this, you don't want to get grumpy with a customs agent. If you start getting an attitude with somebody that really is literally controlling your entry into the kingdom, it's not gonna go well for you. And I saw a man that got upset with his customs agent and he was, just had an attitude and the conversation got tense, more tense, and it finally got to the place where they took this guy off into an office and I just said, man, he could have solved that easily, just been kind and humble. And, and, and we would have got into the country. But if you have an attitude, it's hard to enter into the kingdom. So God only permits humble hearts to enter. Can I read a few verses to you guys? Matthew 5, verse 3. God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Citizenship into the kingdom is theirs. How about this one? God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. That's talking about the new kingdom, the new kingdom that he sets up. Matthew 18, verse three. Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. 
Isaiah 57, verse 15, the high and lofty one who lives in eternity, the holy one says this, I live in the high and holy place with those whose spirits are contrite and humble. I restore the crushed spirit of the humble and revive the courage of those with repentant hearts. Man, if you are a know-it-all and, and you are prideful, you will never see nor inherit the kingdom of God. You've got to allow yourself to be broken down and to become humble and say, I don't know anything, God. I want to embrace everything that you have to tell me. God only permits the humble. And those that are willing to change. This is a big deal in the kingdom of God. You know, the kingdom has its own culture. And it's not the culture of the world. It's not the culture of the kingdoms of the world. It's a different culture. And if you come into the kingdom of God and still try to just maintain everything that uh, you've done and had, you're not truly entering in the kingdom of God. You have to be willing to change. So I, I went to Israel. I had the privilege of going to Israel. And Jewish people practice kosher diets. And one of the, I mean, it's a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff that they follow. One of the things is they don't mix dairy and meat together. So cheeseburgers are out. So if you go to a restaurant, it's either a dairy restaurant or a meat restaurant, but they don't have food in the kitchen that's dairy and meat. It's one or the other. So I went to a restaurant where they served American food and I ordered, I tried to order a cheeseburger and they laughed. They said, we don't, cheeseburger, we don't serve cheeseburgers. Just different. And when I'm there, I'm on their terms. I don't eat cheeseburgers in Israel. They don't serve cheeseburgers in Israel. And when you're in the kingdom of God, there's cultural things and customs that are done that it, unless you're willing to leave your old customs and thinking and everything, you're not going to be able to inherit this new kingdom. It's a different flow, a different style. So first, we overcome the obstacles. Second, have the right attitude. Third, you have to come to the right door. You have to come to the right door. This is something about our immigration that a lot of people don't understand. And it's important that when people enter into the country, we don't wanna tell people they can't come into our country. But if you come, you have to come through the right door. You cannot just come into the country. The kingdom of God is the same way. It, you can come into the kingdom of God, but you can't climb over the wall. You can't come through a part that doesn't include the door. There is only one door into the kingdom of God and you must enter through that door. So let's talk about that door. Who is that door? That door is Jesus. It's not St. Peter. You know, you see all these cartoons that have Peter at the gate of heaven as if he's the one that has the ability to let you in or out of heaven. Peter's not the door. Jonathan's not the door. I can't let you into the kingdom of heaven. There's only one person who can let you into the kingdom of heaven. You have to personally meet him and he's the one that calls you his own. He's the one that gives you immigration papers into his kingdom. You have to meet the man himself and he has to let you into the kingdom. I can encourage you, I can point you in the right direction, but I had to meet him myself. I had to humble myself before him and you have to humble yourself before him and receive your immigration papers directly from him. It's Jesus, he's the way. I wanna read John chapter 10, verse nine. Jesus said, yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. They will come and go freely and will find good pasture. How about this verse, Matthew chapter seven, verse 13. You can enter God's kingdom. Oh, this is so good. Once your eyes are open, you see it everywhere. You can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad and its gate is wide for the many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow. That's because it's only one person big. It's only one person big. It's Jesus big. The gateway to life is very narrow, very narrow, and the road to it is difficult, and only a few ever find it. I had a time of fellowship with a guy who is a bishop of a denomination. 
of a certain geographical area of a denomination and I had a time of fellowship with him and he was telling me about all the churches that he oversaw and he oversees like 50 churches. And he was just telling me how they conduct business there at the church. And each weekend he finds himself at a different one of the churches that he oversees and I said, what do you do when you go? He said, well, I lead them in communion and he said, and then I confirm the new believers. So tell me about that. You confirm the new believers. And he said, well, pretty much anybody who wants to get saved, I have to be the one to, to confirm them. I said, so somebody that wants to get saved has to wait for 50 weeks for you to come and confirm that they're saved. And he said, yeah, that's right. And uh, so he's the way. He's, he is the, he's the gate. And I thought, you know, that's a great illustration of the true gate, which is Jesus. And I can't bring you, to, I can't give you citizenship into the kingdom of God, but Jesus can. You come to him and he'll let you in. So come to the right door. Just in quick recap, we're gonna overcome the obstacles. Second, have the right attitude. Third, come to the right door. By the way, the church is not the right door. The church is not the door. You can come sit in these pews, watch online, this is not the door. Jesus is the door. Uh, we point to him, but the church is not the door. Good behavior is not the door. You can behave good your whole life and that's not the door. Universalism is not the door. Man, there, there's these ideas and Christians buy into this stuff that yeah, my way is Jesus, but this guy's way is Muhammad and this guy's way is, is whatever. And there is only one way. It's Jesus. There's only one kingdom. It's his. This is not Muhammad's kingdom. This is not Buddha's kingdom. It's Jesus's kingdom. It's the only kingdom that's going to keep lasting. So if you want to be in that kingdom, you got to come to that king and get your citizenship. The fourth part of this process is you have to understand the process of being saved. So I'll just be vulnerable, talk transparent with you. I don't like where we've gotten as a church in the way that we see people saved. I understand it because I'm a part of it. But I, the more I study the kingdom of God, the more frustrated I get with the idea that somebody can feel like checking a religious box off by praying a prayer automatically makes them now a citizen of heaven. And so this is a struggle because we want to lead people to eternal life and give and point them in the right direction. But the truth is this, if you say a prayer, but then you don't change anything about your life and, and you don't follow Jesus, you're not saved. So it's just painful. But I, I feel like we really have to make sure that people are becoming citizens of heaven. And I still want to lead people in prayer. I want to lead people into submission to Christ. But there's, there's other steps to this process. Let me give you four basic steps. One, you have to repent of sin. You have to be so contrite, so humble, so broken about your sin that you hate it. You disgust it. And you just say, God, not only am I sorry for this junk, but I'm, I'm stopping it now. I'm turning the other direction and I am gonna follow not my definition of good, I'm following your definition of good from now on. So this is called repentance. It's changing the way you think. That's the first step in the process. The second step in the process is by faith, come to Christ and verbally commit, verbally call him Lord of your life. Romans 10, if you confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that he's Lord. This is a confession that Jesus, I know there's a lot of other options out there, but I put my faith and trust in you. I'm gonna obey you. You are my king. This is that public declaration of faith. Third, 
is you must be born of water and spirit. Je Jesus talking to Nicodemus, he said, how can I be born again? He said, unless you be born of water and spirit, you can't see the kingdom of God. What was he talking about? The symbolism of baptism. He wasn't saying, hey, if you're not baptized, you're not a citizen of heaven, because obviously we have examples of people who weren't baptized and still went to heaven. But the symbolism of baptism is one of, I am leaving my old life behind. It's totally abandoned. I'm leaving my other country, coming into this country. I'm a new person totally. If you've not been water baptized, this is a public declaration to earth and to heaven that you now belong to Jesus Christ. You must be baptized. If you haven't been baptized, then you're missing a huge part of obedience to Christ. You must be baptized. But the water is only the beginning. It's the spirit. He says you must be born of water and the spirit. This regeneration, this miracle that happens in your spirit where the old becomes new. We're not gonna try to make the old you better. We're gonna get a new you. It's a miraculous you that comes by the spirit of God. This is a miracle that happens in your life. You must be born of the water and the spirit. And then finally, you have to follow him. You have to commit to abandon your, your thought patterns, your stuff, your life, and embrace Jesus' culture. This is the process. I'll say it again in simple terms. Repent of sin. By faith, come to Christ and declare allegiance to him. Third, be born of water and spirit. Fourth, follow him. This is what it means to transfer your citizenship from the kingdom of the world to the kingdom of God. So what are the benefits? Why should we do this? Why should we transfer our citizenship from a worldly kingdom to the kingdom of God? Let's read the, the rest of this story of the rich young ruler. Then Peter said to him, we've given up everything to follow you. What will we get? Jesus replied, I assure you that when the world is made new and the son of man sits upon his glorious throne, you who have been my followers will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has given up houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or property for my sake will receive a hundred times as much in return and will inherit eternal life. So what are the benefits of switching the kingdom? Well, for one, you get to know the truth. It's good to not walk in darkness, to not walk in ignorance. You get to know the truth. Another thing is you're filled with peace in this life a supernatural sense of peace that, that fills your heart. Number three, you're gonna inherit eternal life. Do you wanna live forever? Yes. There's only one way to live forever. That's through the gateway of eternal life, Jesus Christ. And the fourth benefit is you're gonna be able to be with Christ forever, live with him forever. So here is my appeal to all who have ears to hear. This world and everything that it offers is fading away quickly. There's one kingdom that will remain. And if you're not a citizen of that kingdom, you better be about going through the process of changing your citizenship from a, a, a system that's failing and falling apart and entering into this new kingdom. And you can only do it by coming to the king, meeting him personally, submitting your life to him. And we're a part of this kingdom. The church is filled with believers who are a part of this kingdom. I'm a citizen of heaven. I got my passport, baby. I got my visa. I got everything I need. I'm a citizen of heaven. And I want to invite you to be one as well. Let me pray for everybody. Father, thank you for your word that it is true. Lord, we submit ourselves to the teaching of your word. Lord, let our hearts be humble. God, let us not be prideful in our minds, but let us become like little children. Let us submit ourselves. Let us be moldable in our hearts. Lord, I pray that for those who have ears to hear and those that you are drawing to salvation, I pray that they would make you the Lord of their life. They would turn from their sin. They would abandon their old ways and they would put their faith in you. Thank you, Lord, for this word today that convicts us and that brings us to a place of repentance. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise the Lord. Come on, let's give God praise for what he spoke to us today.